my name's Joanna Schwartz. I'm a professor of law at UCLA School of Law. And I'm here because I just uh, published a book called Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. Yes, and we are going to be talking about that book. And I would love to um, first ask you um, what brought you to this topic and why you wrote the book. So I've been interested in civil rights litigation and police accountability for more than 20 years. It's a topic that I first became interested in um, as a law student um, and then uh, decided I wanted to be a civil rights attorney and uh, began practicing more than 20 years ago. And while I was in practice, I had a lot of questions about how civil rights litigation actually functioned on the ground because things I was seeing in my practice diverged dramatically from things that I'd been taught in law school. And just to give you one example that I talk about a bit in the book, I was working on a class action against the New York City Department of Corrections, uh, which runs Rikers Island in New York. And there's been decades long litigation against the department for excessive force and failure to supervise and train its officers. So I was preparing to depose an officer, meaning question them under oath during litigation. And I had their personnel file and I was really surprised to see that there was no record in their personnel file about whether they had ever been sued. Um, when I asked this officer under oath, he said he had been sued, but didn't remember how many times he'd been sued, what the allegations were in the cases, what the resolution was in the case, whether the plaintiff won and what they won. And then when we deposed the hires up, the supervisors of these officers up to the assistant wardens, they didn't know about the litigation history of their officers either. And I thought, if we're bringing these cases trying to make a difference, what kind of difference can we make if nobody's paying any attention to what happens in these cases? And that's just one example. There was a lot of questions that came to me during my practice. And when I became a law professor at UCLA in 2010, I really dedicated myself to trying to empirically answer some of these questions, starting with what police departments and uh, and other government organizations know about lawsuits filed against them. But each each empirical question I answered in a study begged another question. And, and basically that tells you what I've been doing over the past 15 years, which is asking and answering questions about how civil rights litigation works on the ground. These are topics that then following George Floyd's murder in May of 2020, all of a sudden um, came on to the national uh, conversation. And I had studied a legal protection named um, qualified immunity for several years that all of a sudden was on protesters' signs uh, you know, across the country. And I decided that it would be really important to translate the research that I've done and also translate um, the the what the legal protections are for officers in these civil rights cases, why it's so difficult to get justice in these cases, and to try to write this uh, information in a way that would be useful to people who practice in the area, but but even more importantly, illuminating to people who don't practice in this area and don't read law review articles for fun. Um, and, I, and I aim to do that by breaking down each of these barriers, talking about them, dedicating a chapter to each, and really couching those stories or the, that information in the stories of real people whose lives have been torn upside down, if not ended, by police misconduct and violence, and then have had such a difficult time seeking justice in the courts. Well, and that's what I really appreciated about um, your writing is that you brought these cases that led to some of what these protections are in a way that was uh, not only immediate, but completely understanding kind of where this case situates itself and then how the outcome of it um, led to some of these protections. But I think I want to start with... Um, the uh, section 1983, which is kind of at the heart of uh, the book and also kind of the heart of the um, protections, right? And, and it was meant to do something differently when it was originated, right? Yeah. So the the way in which people bring lawsuits challenging police officers and, and other government officials' constitutional violations 
is a federal statute, a statute enacted by Congress. It's referred to as Section 1983 now. That's reflecting where it sits in the United States Code. It actually was enacted in 1871, following the Civil War, during the Reconstruction, when Black Americans in the South were being tortured and killed by the Ku Klux Klan and other emerging white supremacist groups. And local law enforcement officers were either doing nothing or participating in the violence. And there was a widespread belief that local judges and juries were not going to do anything to protect the rights of these Black Americans. And so Congress enacted what it referred to then as the Civil Rights Act and also referred to as the Ku Klux Klan Act um, of 1871 that gave people the power to sue uh, for violations of their constitutional rights in federal court, which were was imagined to be more protective of people's rights and black black people's rights specifically. But almost as soon as as this new act became law, the power of it was taken away by a series of decisions by the Supreme Court, the way in which they interpreted the 14th Amendment, which is the Equal Protection Clause, um, and other aspects of the Reconstruction Era Acts. And Section 1983 and some of these other civil rights protections essentially went dormant. Um, and Jim Crow laws uh, pervaded the South and, and the federal courts really were doing nothing to intervene. Fast forward several decades and you have the beginnings of the civil rights movement in the 20th century and a recognition, a growing recognition by the Supreme Court that there was police violence in the South uh, still uh, disproportionately against black people that was not being adequately policed or addressed by the state courts. And so I trace a sort of series of opinions in that vein, resulting in a decision called Monroe versus Pape, decided by the United States Supreme Court in 1961, that held for the first time, 90 years after the Ku Klux Klan Act was passed, that people could sue police officers for violating their constitutional rights. And so that decision, Monroe versus Pape in 1961, really opened the doors to uh, people to allow them to bring these lawsuits under Section 1983. Um, and, and that has been an incredibly important way to hold law enforcement and other government entities accountable. But as I show, there was a high point in 1871 when the statute was enacted, maybe another high point in 1961 when the Supreme Court recognized it could be used to sue law enforcement and other government officials. And then again, after, as, as in after 1871, when the power to sue was stripped away, since 1961, the Supreme Court has acted in a variety of different ways that I outlined in the book to strip away the power of Section 1983 and make it more and more difficult to bring these cases. Well, and I think, um, you know, one of the, maybe you could, so 1963, is it, right? 1961, yeah. It's, there's a lot of numbers. It's 1871, yeah. <laughs> 1961, and then 1983 is the name of the statute. That's right, and then I was looking down at the Terry stops in 1967, and I got confused, so this is why I'm not a lawyer. Um, but then <laughs> talk about, like, what was the immediate um, pushback then against Monroe, uh, Monroe versus Pape? I know there was a dissent written, but then some of the cases that came after and and we can start getting into like qualified immunity and some of the other things that come up. Yeah. Yeah. The, the arguments, the, the concerns after Monroe <coughs> versus Pape was that the courthouse doors were going to be open too wide. And in Supreme Court decisions and popular commentary and commentary by academics and by government attorneys, there was a familiar story told and retold that if it was too easy to sue, courthouses would be filled to the brim with frivolous cases, that officers would be bankrupted uh, for split second mistakes, good faith mistakes made on the job. And with that threat of liability, 
no one would agree to accept government employment or officers who were on the streets wouldn't vigorously enforce the law. And without a robust public safety mechanism, we would devolve into chaos. And and you really can see um, in the Supreme Court's decisions and in other popular commentary, that entire story, the fear of too many lawsuits then ending in concerns about a, a lawless society. And you see this in the in in the many protections that um, we have seen uh, been developed in the in the years after Monroe versus Pate. Those same concerns have then come up now post 2020 as there is conversation about police reform. It's it's the exact same arguments. And part of what I try to show in the book, and this is what my research has really focused on over the past 15 years, those claims are overblown, if not false, but they're powerful and frightening to those who believe them. Right, and I think that leads us into, there's kind of a two-pronged attack um, on these uh, rights. One is monetary and one is like culpability. So one's a criminal liability. So if, if I was a police officer and I shot you, could I go to jail? But then additionally, how much would I have to pay the family for something that I did wrong? And and I think that that, um, that thread is really pulled pretty tight by you and shows a pretty good argument against both of those points. But um, so maybe you could explain us, explain to us how qualified immunity addresses both of those points differently. Sure, and I should say, <laughs> excuse me, my book really focuses on the second of those two, on the ability to bring a civil suit, meaning a suit seeking money damages or some kind of forward-looking relief, referred to as injunctive relief, an order that the department change a policy, for example. I I focus much less on the criminal side. Um, and part of what I say in the introduction to the book is that the reason I'm focused on the civil side is and these civil rights suits is that they are for many people the only possible viable alternative. Um, police officers are criminally charged in fewer than 2% of fatal shootings. They're convicted in about a third of those. And if you're talking about non-fatal force or other kinds of police misconduct that don't involve the use of force, criminal prosecutions are vanishingly rare. And so for many people, the way to get some form of justice is through a civil suit. And qualified immunity is a protection that comes into play in those civil cases. It's not available. There's other protections for officers in criminal cases. Qualified immunity applies in these civil cases. And it's a defense that, that was created by the Supreme Court in 1967, so six years after Monroe versus Pape was decided. And, and at the time when it was first enacted or first created by the Supreme Court, it was described as a good faith defense. So if an officer thought that they were following the law when they made an arrest, but in fact, the law that they arrested the people under was later found unconstitutional, the officer acted in good faith and shouldn't be held liable. But the standard for qualified immunity has gotten stronger and stronger over the years, again, fueled by these concerns about the dangers of too much justice. The first main step was in 1982 in a case called Harlow versus Fitzgerald, when the Supreme Court said, forget about officers' good faith or bad faith. In order to get to the bottom of that, we're going to need to depose officers, question them under oath, perhaps go to trial. And we want to save officers from the burdens and distractions of being sued in insubstantial cases. And so the court said, let's just focus on whether the law is clearly established. And they didn't really say what clearly established meant, but as the court has uh, gone on in the decades, they've described clearly established law in a way that is almost impossible to meet. There has to be a prior court case holding unconstitutional, virtually identical conduct. So it's not enough to say, it's unconstitutional to use force against a person who has surrendered, 
That is a general principle in the mind of the Supreme Court. That's not particularized enough to the facts of the case to put an officer on notice. <laughs> so you have to find a prior court case where an officer used a similar type of force under similar circumstances. And I talk in the book about a case called Baxter versus Bracey, where a man was um, suspected of a, of a burglary. He was sitting down, put his hands in the air in surrender. And the officers, it was this was in Memphis, um, released or Nashville, uh, released their police dog on Alexander Baxter anyway. Um, there was a prior court case that had said it was unconstitutional to release a police dog on a person who had surrendered by lying down. But in the view of the court that heard Alexander Baxter's case, the factual distinction between a person surrendering by sitting down with their hands in the air and a person surrendering by lying on the ground was uh, different enough that the officer was entitled to qualified immunity. And that qualified immunity gets them off the hook, right? That keeps them from having any ramifications or consequence from the action, correct? Well, it certainly prevents their the the Section 1983 case from succeeding. Um, in many states, there can be state law claims, claims of assault or battery, um, and those can be pursued. Sometimes they have their own immunities. Um, they tend not to um, allow for the recovery of attorney's fees by the lawyers bringing these cases, um, which ends up meaning the, without the Section 1983 claim, the case becomes far less um, financially viable for a lawyer to pursue. And um, so there's those points. It's also worth saying there can be employment consequences, um, but there don't tend to be um, in these cases. In addition to criminal prosecutions being rare, internal discipline uh, is also extremely rare. So it, it is often that it's the Section 1983 claim that would be the announcement of wrongdoing by the officer and qualified immunity can prevent that wrongdoing from happening in precisely the cases where officers have been found to have violated the Constitution. Yeah, and that's so. Even so, on appeal, even if we break uh, qualified immunity and someone's held um, to consequences, then in, on appeal it's usually granted anyway, right? And I, that kind of gets back to um, you have two chapters on uh, judges and juries, and I think that that is a huge piece of this whole process that is very rarely. Uh, spoken about. So I really appreciated those two chapters. And if you could kind of walk us through what you found in those and how each of those two pieces work in civil cases. Absolutely. And you broke up for a second, but I think I know, I think I know what you said. <laughs> Hopefully your listeners, our listeners will too. So yes, there are two chapters dedicated, one to judges and one to juries. And it was important to me to include those chapters because the laws that we have, laws like qualified immunity, don't apply themselves. They're not self-executing, right? It's judges who are applying these, um, these rules. And beyond things like qualified immunity, there's all sorts of other kinds of decisions that judges make in the course of um, litigating or supervising the litigation of a case, like whether you can get discovery, how much discovery you can get from the other side, um, who you can depose and who you can't depose, whether you can have experts or not, who the juries, jurors are who are seated to hear the case. There's so many decisions that judges get to make between the beginning and the end of the case and as I argue in Shielded, the way in which those judges see the world, their prior experiences, their work experiences, um, perhaps even their gender, race, uh, upbringing, et cetera, influence the way in which they see the world and can influence the way in which they rule on these decisions. Even something like qualified immunity, which is a settled legal rule, has all sorts of gaps in the Supreme Court's decisions on these cases, places where judges can exercise some discretion. So I talk in the book about a case where 
uh, a, a case with with really tragic facts. A, a black man named um, uh, Robbie Tolan, who was shot and survived, um, but shot by a white officer in Bel Air, Texas, and uh, the judge handling the case was really unsympathetic to his claims and made that patently obvious throughout the course of the litigation. And and I show because the case bounced back and forth between the appeals courts and the trial court and and, um, even what's called a magistrate judge who offered some tentative rulings, you can see and imagine how this case might have gone differently had there been another judge ruling on this case. Um, the next chapter about juries uh, asks uh, or, or makes in some ways the same observation about juries who are um, coming to cases from with their own experiences, with their own preconceptions. And what I argue in that chapter is that juries are selected in ways that systematically weed out people who would be more sympathetic um, or might tend to be more sympathetic to plaintiffs in civil rights cases. Um, In federal court, um, any uh, person who has been a juror, um, which necessarily weeds out people who have firsthand experience of the criminal justice system, uh, the federal jury pools then are limited to registered voters um, which there are racial disparities and economic disparities in uh, who registers to vote. Beyond that, um, the way <laughs> the process works is that a person is mailed a juror questionnaire. If they don't have stable housing, they may not receive it. Uh, if they don't have stable housing or a stable economic situation or a stable work situation, they might might not take the time to fill out that questionnaire, send it back in and show up when they are um, called to jury. And all of these things add up. I talk about a case that that was brought in in Florida and some research done in that federal district in Florida, finding that somewhere along the lines of 40 percent of black members of this community were disqualified from one of in one of one or more of these ways from serving on juries and that disproportionate effect on uh, black juries jurors and it was also true of latino jurors has been um challenges to that have been um rejected by the courts but it has a real impact and and lawyers who litigate these cases will absolutely tell you um it, it has a real impact uh when you are weeding out from the pool jurors who might see things in from more readily from the perspective of a plaintiff in a civil rights case. And can you talk a little bit more about the perception of civil rights attorneys in the um, and the perception of them in the court system? Because I think that there is some of like the Supreme Court is worried that they're going to get paid too much, um, that they're going <laughs> to it goes back to what you were talking about earlier about throwing the doors open and so i think there's you know we have a perception of defense attorneys being one way slightly criminal maybe on themselves so what about what do you think the perception of civil rights attorneys is and how can that be uh addressed so i think that you know if if listeners think for a moment to just pause for a moment about what they imagine when they think of a civil rights attorney. Um, I imagine that they may imagine uh, the sort of an ambulance chaser, you know, a person who is looking to get a buck off someone else's misery, and also that there are many, many, many of them, and plenty of them, too many, (laughs) too many of them. And, you know, we can debate whether there are too many or too few lawyers in the country, but I think that it is very true and stand by the notion that there are too few civil rights attorneys and too few attorneys practicing poverty law more generally, providing legal services to people who can't afford those legal services. Um, 
And the way in which civil rights lawyers are paid is part of the problem. So um, most lawyers, if they're bringing a personal injury case or a medical malpractice case, their clients pay them on what's called contingency. So the lawyer would get nothing if their client lost in court. And if they won, they'd get a portion, usually a third or so of any recovery. Um, Congress in uh, the 70s concluded that this was not a good system for civil rights cases filed under Section 1983 because there's a value in bringing these cases. There's a value in vindicating constitutional rights, even when the harms may not be um, so financially significant. And so Congress created a statute called Section 1988 to add another, another number to our discussion that said prevailing plaintiffs, plaintiffs who win, should get their attorney's fees. But in a common theme throughout the book, the Supreme Court has interpreted that entitlement in a way that has really um, made the initial goals of Congress in passing this statute very difficult to obtain. So what the Supreme Court has said is that uh, if a case is settled, and the vast majority of these cases that are successful settle, that the defense can waive the plaintiff's entitlement to attorney's fees meaning just give them a lump sum, say, take it or leave it. And what that's ended up meaning is that the contingency fee system is basically back in place. And lawyers think about these cases from that contingency fee perspective. And when they're thinking about them, often these lawyers in many parts of the country, lawyers who bring civil rights cases are not solely bringing civil rights cases. It's part of their practice. They're also personal injury attorneys or um, medical malpractice attorneys or criminal defense attorneys. And a case, a person who suffered an egregious wrong comes through their door, the lawyer thinks, this is a terrible case. Uh, I can win it. And boy, Section 1988 says I get my attorney's fees. And then they spend thousands of dollars worth of their time or tens of thousands of dollars worth of their time. And the case is dismissed on qualified immunity grounds. Or they get to a settlement <laughs> and then realize they're only getting paid a tenth of the of the time that they spent. And those lawyers um, either buckle down and learn the law and dedicate themselves to the to the practice, but but more often and or plenty often decide, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to go back to my personal injury work or my um, medical malpractice work. And I, I mean, I've, I've been talking to lawyers who have practiced civil rights work for decades who then have started taking medical malpractice or dental malpractice, they say, because it helps pay the bills. So the idea that there's a lot of lawyers getting rich quick uh, off of these civil rights cases simply isn't a reality. And what it ends up meaning is that in parts of the country, particularly outside the large cities, um, in the South especially, lawyers who are experienced in these cases are very hard to come by. Well, that brings up a... Uh... Second question I have about payment, and that is when there is a judgment against a police officer, um, who pays that money and where does that money come from? And in these judgments where, you know, sometimes there are millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, where's that money coming from? And is the state paying it or individual officers? And what's the story behind that? So if you listened to defenders of qualified immunity, they would tell you that officers are threatened with bankruptcy every time they are sued. That is just false. And it's not qualified immunity that protects officers from being bankrupted. Instead, state and local governments across the country have what are called indemnification statutes or indemnification policies. And what those policies provide is that when an officer is sued, um, if they if it's if they're sued for something in the course and scope of their employment, so not a car crash when they're off duty, but something as as relates to their job, that they will be provided with a lawyer, and that a settlement or judgment against them will be paid by the local government or by the insurer for that local government. And when I looked at payments in eighty one jurisdictions across a 
um, six year period, I found that 99.98% of the dollars came from local governments and from insurers. 0.02% of the dollars were paid by officers uh, in two of the 81 jurisdictions. And even in those jurisdictions, officer contributions were rare and averaged about $4,000, which is not the making of a bankruptcy petition. Um, that was a study, speaking you know, before about the fact that each study would beget another study. Having done that study, then I started thinking, well, where is the money coming from? If it's coming from the local governments and the insurers, but but where in the budgets for these local governments is the money coming? And what I found was there's there's a lot of variation. Um, in some places, it's just paid directly from the central budget. In other places, uh, money is taken as part of the police department's budget to satisfy those settlements and judgments. But what I found was, regardless of the formal arrangement, uh, where the money technically came from, that very rarely did those payments have a financial impact on the department. You know, paying uh, settlements and judgments that were larger than expected didn't require officers or departments to cut back on overtime or equipment. And, and on the other side, reducing litigation costs didn't give them extra money that they could then spend on overtime or equipment. Um, and some of the most distressing, I think one of the most distressing things that I that I learned in this research is that when there is more money than expected to pay these uh, settlements and judgments, the money tends to come from parts of the city's budget that were earmarked for the least politically powerful. So in Chicago, which gives the police department money to, to pay settlements and judgments. And every year the police department spends more than it has been budgeted. The excess comes from other parts of the budget. And a lawyer for the city of Chicago, a former lawyer for the city of Chicago told me when there were high payouts in these police misconduct cases, it meant that we did away with lead testing in our public housing. And those are the very people who are the least politically powerful and probably the people who are disproportionately likely to be subjects of police violence and misconduct, who were then having to essentially foot the bill uh, for that misconduct at the expense of their own health. Yeah, it's all very uh, distressing. And um, just to kind of wrap things up now, what would you, uh, last chapter of your book, you offer some very strong uh, ideas and prescriptions on possible solutions to some of these problems. So maybe you could just touch on a couple of those, um, especially the injuncture uh, relief, because we didn't really get into that that much, but I think it would be good. Absolutely. And and I will say, um, this this book can feel like a, a little depressing, um, a little bit of a of a downer, and it is a book about police misconduct. So if you can find a chipper and cheer, cheerful book about that topic, you know I'd be curious to to know what it is. But I I do try in the last chapter, after describing all of these many barriers to relief, to try to um, offer some some ways to move forward and. There's a lot that the Supreme Court or Congress could do. They could either could roll back qualified immunity, um, make it more financially uh, viable for lawyers to take these cases. You mentioned injunctive relief, which uh, there's a whole chapter about this, which there's a Supreme Court decision that makes it very difficult for people to be able to seek forward looking relief, changes in policies and pushes them instead to get money damages when many people what they really would like is some sort of um, vindication that would prevent something similar from happening in the future those restrictions could also be rolled back by the supreme court or congress um, i don't have a whole lot of faith in either institution right now when it comes to police reform but there's a lot of interesting things that are happening in the states and, and even more in local governments. So there have been states like Colorado that after uh, the murder of George Floyd passed a comprehensive police reform bill and essentially 
created a state law right to sue for constitutional violations where qualified immunity is not a defense. It's it's pretty remarkable that the statute was created to find an alternative forum to avoid the states, which were so hostile to civil rights. And now the federal system is so hostile to civil rights that we're now looking to the states. But states are considering these kinds of bills. Um, a number of them have been unsuccessful because lobbying efforts by unions and other law enforcement officials have have made this same claim about officers being bankrupted for these these reasonable mistakes that that I argue again and again in legislative hearings are are not uh, not have no relationship to reality. Uh, but those efforts continue. And there's a lot of interesting work that's happening at the local level. Philadelphia has ended uh, or limited traffic stops by officers. Memphis is considering a similar bill or similar policy change. And there's efforts across the country to, uh, to have unarmed mental health professionals respond when people are having mental health crises. I also think that there's a lot of valuable work that could be done and it's not being done enough by local governments to uh, condition their budgets to law enforcement agencies on the agencies collecting and analyzing information about the lawsuits brought against them. There could be uh, more um, done to take the money out of the police department's budget to give them more incentive to, to pay attention in these cases. And importantly, that's work that the local level that listeners can engage in themselves. Um, it's sometimes hard to get your um, your federal senator uh, to to listen to you, or even your state senator. But it, you know, every community has you know a city council or other or other government entity um, that that can listen and can respond to these kinds of pressures. And we're seeing that happen all around the country. And so. Part of my goal in the book is with that last chapter is to give readers a sense of things that they can do in their immediate communities. Well, thank you for the book and thank you for the interview and thank you for all the work you do uh, both in the classroom and outside the classroom. And uh, yeah, so if anyone wanted to get in contact or follow you anywhere, do you have social media that you? I do. I'm, um, I don't know if, people are listening to or following this chat, but I'm <clears throat> on Twitter. I am JC Schwartz prof though. J C S C H W A R T Z P R O F. Um, I also have a website that has a lot of material about the book, including some of the stories in the book. And that is uh, Joanna Schwartz.net. So J O A N N A S C H W A R T Z.net. And I hope you check it out.